Welcome to the last of the, the Powerful Owl Project uh, videos. So, BirdLife Australia has been running this Powerful Owl Project for about 10 years. And one of the reasons uh, it works as well as it does is because the people who come on board um, do what's in the best interest of the owls and what's in the best interest of all the people who um, either manage own uh, the properties that we're working on. So we'll just go over um, some of the sort of conditions and uh, the rules uh, around participating in the project. And um, before we get to that though, we just want to say thanks to all the sponsors who make our work possible. And thanks especially to the, uh, the hundreds of volunteers who make really is a huge effort uh, to find these owls. And the only reason we're able to do it is because of the, the many people who are involved. So the first step you'll need to uh, undertake if you want to sign up formally to the project is you'll have to sign the confidentiality and um, the confidentiality agreement which also includes um, some conditions that you'll agree to uh, abide by the protocols and, uh, that, that we've outlined in, in the method that's in one of the other videos. So a couple of the important things in that document are one, that you're not going to tell anyone else who's not signed up to the project where a powerful owl breeding hollow is or where powerful owl roosting site is. So the odd powerful owl sighting doesn't matter too much, but if you're, if there's a regular place used by powerful owls and a lot of people find out about it, that's when we start to get um, visitation impacting powerful owl breeding success, or we can start to get, and this hasn't happened in Queensland yet, but has happened in New South Wales where you get some aggressive owls that can hurt people. So we don't want either one of those things happening, so please don't advertise the location was number one. Number two, really respect the owls. Um, keep your distance. Uh, go as far back away as you can. If you stumbled on one and you're pretty close to it, back away and see if um, you, know, you can still observe them. And you usually don't have to observe them for very long at all before you know what you need to know um, for that visit, whether there's chicks or not, or evidence of breeding. Um, it doesn't take long to figure out. So you don't have to hang out in an area for very long, and we recommend you move on um, as quickly as possible once you get that information. Um, we also recommend that you leave immediately if there's any aggressive behavior. So, so far in Queensland, the only aggressive behavior that we've witnessed are two females that flew in within about three or four meters of us uh, when we entered the territory. Um, that suggested to us that it's probably time to leave. Um, it wasn't aggressive behavior per se, but it could have been um, the next step. So if a bird is coming towards you, um, yeah, go ahead and give it, give it some space. Uh, the other thing to look out for is, so owls' eyes are ridiculously large. And they're so large that they can't move their eyes. Okay? So that's why when you're watching them, they're, you know, they're moving their heads around. And so if they're really keyed in on you, they'll just be you know, moving their heads all over the place. If they're doing that for more than five minutes, it means they're paying more attention to you than they are going about their normal routine. Just leave and come back when they're kind of settled down. You're more likely to solve the riddle of what's going on when they've settled down anyway. Other aggressive behaviors to look for include um, clearly swooping. If that occurs, um, leave. Uh, but sometimes, uh, right before an owl swoops, like a lot of birds will just kind of lift one leg up and rest it when they're roosting, right? So they'll be standing on one leg. You see that? Owls will do it as well. 
But if you see a bird that's kind of checking you out and it makes a fist with one of its talons, uh, that's a good indication that it's about to swoop and it's probably a good time to leave. Um, one of the other things to, to look out for is if an owl is kind of looking at you and it lets out one loud mm. that means it's time to leave. And if any of those aggressive behaviors are seen, please let us know about them. Uh, the other thing, uh, no flash photography. So you can come back during the day and get some great shots of an owl during the day. And if you're spotlighting, switch to red light as soon as an animal is in that red light. That's the condition of our ethics approval. And um, I just uh, spotlight with constant red light. But if you switch to red, you can switch to red fairly easily by just putting a bit of red cellophane over the lens. And again, you don't need to be watching these animals for very long, so you don't need to stay in an area for very long. Avoid shining the light right on their face. Um, and generally, you'll see uh, under red light, animals, nocturnal animals, will go about their ordinary behavior more readily. Um, they're just clearly much less agitated uh, than they are under white light, which is understandable. Um, so that's the first document you need to sign. Uh, the second document you'll need to sign before you're sent to location of where we think owls are um, is the risk assessment. And the risk assessment has recently uh, been revised to include um, recommendations around coronavirus. So currently, uh, so we're recommending that no matter how things change, and we expect things will continue to change as state and federal government rules change, that you abide by those rules and be across those rules. But currently, um, you could go out in your own suburb for a walk in the forest. And you could go out with one other person, as long as you kept an appropriate distance apart the entire time. You drove there in separate vehicles, um, you know, and keep keep a few meters between you. You, know, you don't need to be right on top of each other to go walk in the woods together. Um, so that's allowed currently. If you live in a suburb where there's no forests, um, or if you're at high risk from complications of coronavirus and you don't want to leave the house, then don't leave the house. Um, the owls will be there when this passes. Please, if anything, stay home and uh, learn about the owls and go out again uh, when it's safe to do so. The other most important thing that you can do when you go out to look for owls is to tell somebody where you're going and when you expect to be back. And you need to tell somebody who cares whether or not you return or not, or at least is responsible enough to raise the alarm when you don't come back. So, um, yeah, that's the most important thing. Because you're working in places where um, there's not a lot of activity, or at times of day when there's not a lot of activity. You need to let somebody know where you're going and when you expect to be back. The other thing that um, you can get really complacent when you're working on the roads at night. Um, because it doesn't seem like anybody's around, and then all of a sudden somebody will come ripping down the road. So be sure to park off roads and do your work off of roads. So if you're on the roads, you're more likely to run into an accident anyway. But um, you can feel really safe and secure when nobody's around at night. Not always the case. Uh, if there's a severe, extreme, or catastrophic fire danger, um, we're recommending people don't go out. If one of those days emerges, um, we'll let people know. But they tend to be those kinds of days you wouldn't want to be in the field anyway, really hot and miserable. So, um, otherwise, it's fairly, um, the recommendations are fairly consistent with any work that you do in the outdoors. Uh, if you're walking up and down those creek lines looking for owls um, off the trails, 
you'll definitely want long sleeves, long pants, enclosed shoes, um, and, and bug spray, which will keep help keep the ticks away somewhat. <laughs> uh, you'll probably get ticks and scratches no matter what you do, but um, it'll reduce them, and um, it'll you know avoid snake bites and, and other things. Uh, sunscreen, water, first aid kit, avoid working. All of those things, um, which are quite um, typical of working in the outdoors just generally. Um, and again, we want to avoid this situation, so respect the owls, keep your distance, um, don't make them uncomfortable, because they can make us uncomfortable if they want to. Uh, the other thing that we need to keep in mind is we need to respect the, the rules and the wishes of land managers and landowners. And if we don't do that, you know, this project will come grinding to a halt. So it's really important that in whatever area you are working, you respect whatever conditions are a part of working in that area. So some areas will require different permits, a lot of areas will require you give someone some notification before you go in. Often that's just sending an email and you don't need to expect a response to that email, but um, you'll only get a response if, um, if there's a problem with you going in. If they're doing a controlled burn or if they're spraying or if there's some other reason they don't want you in the reserve, they'll let you know. So, if we can do that, um, we'll likely continue to have access to a lot of these areas, um, which is awesome because there's some beautiful chunks of forest um, right around Brisbane. We're very lucky here. Um, we have a lot of bird diversity. We have a lot of beautiful forests so that are still around. Anyway, uh, if you're in an area and you feel uncomfortable for any reason, just leave. You can always come back or somebody else can go in. I can go in. Um, you know, if, if you're hearing music or voices, um, you can leave and come back when it's quieter. It's better when it's quieter anyway. Um, avoid toilet blocks or other places where people congregate um, at night sometimes. So, yeah, probably the most dangerous thing when working out in the outdoors um, is not the wildlife or the natural environment. It is, it is the people that you might run across. Um, and generally, they're just um, use some common sense and avoid situations where you might run into somebody. So, any time you go out and do a survey, and we've talked in another video about why we want this to be done, but if you could please record a bird survey every time you go out, even if you see zero birds, those zeros are gold. And if you can record that data in bird data, bird data is Bird Life Australia's database where it gathers all the bird records from all the databases it can find and shares data with most of these databases as well. Um, all the data goes directly into ALA and again there's a variety of, of data sharing that happens but it's hard to make databases talk to one another. It takes a lot of time. So it's much easier for me if you're entering all your records in bird data, I can just flip on my computer when I get home and um, I, can, I can see what everybody's up to. So please enter a bird data record every time you go out. And anytime you go out, if you see birds, if you notice birds, enter them in bird data. So because birds are so easy to see and identify, when you're out and about, there's some of the parts of biodiversity that we have the most data on. So we don't have a lot of data on lizards, right? um, because they're hard to find. But you can often see a lot of birds when you go out. And because of that, right across the continent, we have data on which we can then use to tell us, well, where are birds doing well? Where are they doing poorly? 
Um, where are the places we think are most in need of some kind of conservation action? Um, where are the places that birds are suggesting other wildlife or other parts of the ecosystem might also be in trouble? We can begin to unpack those kinds of questions just because there's millions of bird records submitted by thousands of volunteers right across the country. So when you submit a bird record, any bird record, it's useful, uh, especially to somebody like me who plays with data. And if you get enough data, you can start to understand how a bird's population is changing over time. And if you're lucky, you might be able to figure out what's correlated with when that bird's population is low and what's correlated with really useful to enter those records, and bird data is really easy to use. You can download it for free as an app on your phone. Um, it has a map that will show up, which is handy when you're in the middle of the forest at night. And um, again, it, it's very easy to use. You can also use it online if, uh, if you don't want to download the map. Uh, and one of the things I like most about bird data is the way it treats sensitive species. So this is particularly true for powerful owl. Um, when you enter a record, you'll see where that record is located. I'll see where that record is located, but the general public is going to see a location that's a couple hundred meters at least away from that location. And that's just to limit the, uh, the chance that you're going to get paparazzi around a nest tree or around a roosting owl if you're and the more that happens, the more we risk a, a poor wildlife-human interaction of some kind. Right? So, um, yeah, that's one of the things we really like about bird data. If you do sign up formally for uh, for the project, there's three steps that you need needed to do. You need to sign the confidentiality agreement and get it back to me. You need to sign in the risk assessment and get it back to me. You need to fill out a Google form that tells me what your email address is, um, what your address is, um, which I need for one of the permits, um, that tells me if you want to be contacted by other volunteers on the project or if you're happy to contact others every time you go out in case others want to join you. Um, that kind of thing will be not going on as long as coronavirus is, is with us, but it, it worked really well last year. Um, and then I will send you, once you've done those three things, I will send you a Google Earth map and a location of where we think these birds are going to be found. And then you'll do you know, your one and a half hour walks once a week at desk check the place out during the day. I'll also send you a link uh, to all kinds of material, including these presentations, including um, owl calls, um, methods that are in, in a PDF format, all kinds of resources that'll, that you can draw on if you want to. Um, and I'll send you email contacts if you wanted those when you signed up um, of other people who are working in the region so you can communicate with them and possibly go out with them. Um, and finally, we've got a, a bunch of flyers. We've got hard copy, and the flyers are also available as PDFs in the, the files you'll have access to. Um, but those you can just pop in a letterbox. And if you're working in private properties, or in areas where there's a lot of private properties, often you can just put a, um, a flyer in the letterbox and we'll hear from somebody who says, oh yeah, I've had power files breeding on my place for years. Um, so it can, you know, a lot of people know where these birds are. Um, it just hasn't been communicated across at least all the databases. Um, so we're finding the more we get out and talk to people, um, the more people already know where, where birds are located. So flyers help us understand that, and there's also a flyer. If you want to get onto a property, you're pretty convinced there's a breeding hollow, but you want to check it out, there's a flyer to ask for permission to go onto a place. So um, those resources are available, and there's all kinds of other things that are available. 
I mean, when I first started birding, you know, you had to carry around a dictionary, uh, a bird guide, uh, to figure out what was what. And now you've got a bird guide that you can download onto your phone for about 30 bucks, and it has all the calls on it. I mean, the, the Morpham app has all the, all the calls available. Uh, amazing, you know, the kinds of things that are available now. Uh, iNaturalist allows you to take a picture of um, a plant or an animal, and upload the location that you took that picture, and people will identify what it was that you saw. It's a great way to learn about natural history. Um, you can contact the Powerful Wild Project anytime via email. We've got a website. The Call Urban Wildlife app is something we're encouraging people to use, where you can enter mammal sightings, possum or glider sightings. Um, and we'd encourage you to, to use that app. There's another video that talks about that in a little bit more. Um, so all kinds of resources that are available. If you have any questions, just please get in touch. Um, I hope you will get formally involved with the project um, because every set of eyes and ears helps and we tend to have more fun anyway when we're going out to 